Hi. So hopefully this is my last philosophy video because I've been spending so much time trying to get like all my different little ideas um, down in the computer and I need to get on with my life. Um, so I started this by reading Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, and I did a video on that. And then I read Tom Reagan's book, The Case for Animal Rights, and I did a video on that. And then more recently I did a video on Peter Singer's Practical Ethics and my thinking on that. Then I did a follow-up video that talked about like this population scenario that I thought made, tried to make sense of some of his ideas. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to do a video on what my ethical framework is. And so then I had to kind of get it down, you know, like, well, what is my ethical framework? And I put this together kind of using these guys thinking as the basis just to kind of ha have a start from there. Um, what I had said, you know, after doing my first couple of videos was, I see where these guys are coming from and everything, but like, why is it that, you know, we've, we have human beings in this moral sphere and here they've opened it up a little wider to include some different animals. And my thinking is like, why not just, why don't we have moral consideration for everything on earth, <laughs> including all of the animals and plants and rocks and things and air and water and whatever else. Um, so what I came away with was like, why don't we like, we shouldn't damage or harm anything unnecessarily is something like what I was saying. So I thought I'd just start here. I think I'm just gonna pretty much mostly just read this thing I've written. Um, so ethics is a theory or system of moral values. And morals are concerned with the judgment of right or wrong in human action and character. So ethics has typically dealt with how human actions affect other humans. But both Peter Singer and Tom Reagan expand the circle of moral consideration to include other animals. Neither philosopher expands that circle to include some animals, such as insects, or plants or non-living things like mountains, minerals, plants, water, or air, except perhaps as they are necessary to humans. So I thought I would just read a couple of paragraphs from each of these authors just to give you an idea. Some of this is repetition of where they're coming from with that. So Peter Singer says, if a being is not capable of suffering or of experiencing enjoyment or happiness, there is nothing to be taken into account. This is why the limit of sentience, and he has in parentheses, using the term as convenient, if not strictly accurate, shorthand for the capacity to suffer or experience enjoyment or happiness. So he's saying this is why the limit of sentience is the only defensible boundary of concern for the interests of others. Thus my very, he goes on, he has said before, thus my very natural concern that my own wants, needs, and desires, henceforth I will sh shall refer to them as preferences, be looked after, must, when I think ethically, be extended to the preferences of others. So not just myself, but I have to look after the preferences of others. So he also says when he's talking about as far as like an environmental ethic, to an extent, to extend an ethic in a plausible way beyond sentient beings is a difficult task. An ethic based on the interests of sentient creatures is on familiar ground. Sentient creatures have wants and desires. The question, what is it like to be a possum drowning, at least makes sense, even if it is impossible for us to give a more precise answer than it must be horrible. In reaching moral decisions affecting sentient creatures, we can attempt to add up the effects of different actions on all the sentient creatures affected by the alternative actions open to us. This provides us with at least some rough guide to what might be the right thing to do. There is, however, nothing that corresponds to what it is like to be a tree dying because its roots have been flooded. Once we abandon the interests of sentient creatures as our source of value, where do we find value? What is good or bad for non-sentient creatures and why does it matter? <clears throat> so that's his thinking on that. And Tom Reagan, this is a couple quotes from him. Some non-human animals resemble normal humans in morally relevant ways. In particular, they bring the mystery of a unified psychological presence to the world. Like us, they possess a variety of sensory, cognitive, cognitive, and volitional capacities. They see and hear, believe and desire, remember and anticipate, plan and intend. 
Moreover, what happens to them matters to them. These and a host of other psychological states and dispositions collectively help define the mental life and relative well-beings of those, in my terminology, subjects of a life. That's his terminology. We know better as raccoons and rabbits, beavers and bison, chipmunks and chimpanzees, you and I. So then he goes on to talk about the possibility of an environmental ethic. As I have argued elsewhere, the very possibility of developing a genuine ethic of the envi environment as distinct from the ethic for its use turns on the possibility of making the case that natural objects, though they do not meet the subject of a life criterion, can nonetheless have inherent value. Nevertheless, it is extraordinarily difficult to give an intelligible account of inherent value in this connection. For example, though criteria can be given regarding when, say, an oak tree is good of its kind, for example, a good, good is an oak tree, and though this criterion are not dependent on a good, good oak tree's having utility for others or being the object of anybody else's interest, an oak tree's being good of its kind by itself has no more moral significance than, say, a cancer cells or murderers being good of their kind. So they were saying, um, you know, here's Peter Singer, once we abandon the interests of sentient creatures as our source of value, where do we find value? What is it like to be a tree dying because its roots have been flooded? And Tom Reagan says, an oak tree being good of its kind by itself has no more moral significance than say a cancer cells or a murderer's being good of their kind. So I'm saying here, this is me talking about my ethical system. An ethical system is intended to help humans decide if our actions are right or wrong. Nothing in this determination requires that the objects of our actions must be like us. Traditionally, we would have focused on how humans should interact in dealing with other humans because these are our most common interactions, especially hundreds of years ago when any human impact on the natural world would have been much less apparent than it is now. And so the focus would have been on how an individual human would interact with other humans in the context of our lives as social creatures. A little bit of water here. However, a human-centered ethic is not the focus of every culture. <clears throat> So I was just reading, um, along with these other books, uh, For a Future to be Possible by Thich Nhat Hanh. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And he says, quote, We humans are made entirely of non-human elements, just, such as plants, minerals, earth, clouds, and sunshine. For our practice to be deep and true, we must include the ecosystem. If the environment is destroyed, humans will be destroyed too. Protecting human life is not possible without also protecting the lives of animals, plants, and minerals, unquote. So here we have a philosophy based on the interconnectedness of entities versus a philosophy that unashamedly selects characteristics apparently only held by humans and then identifies only those characteristics as having moral significance. For example, Singer and Reagan have determined that having desires or preferences are traits worthy of moral consideration. And by golly, it turns out that humans have desires and preferences and maybe some other animals do too. But if we were to step back and ask from where did these human characteristics arise, we would realize that these beliefs and desires that Tom Reagan identifies and these wants, desires, and needs or preferences that Peter Singer talks about ultimately come from our nature. And if we place moral significance on our own nature, then why wouldn't we rec also recognize that there is value in the nature of every other entity on earth? So there's my moral framework and I could stop there, but I'm gonna go on and on. <laughs> so if you were old enough, you'll remember a program on television called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And so um, in the few times where we had a television when I was growing up, I would watch this program called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, where every week scientists would go out and shoot tranquilizer darts into various different animals, tagging them and then setting them free in order to track their habits. I'm convinced that the most atheist of scientists and philosophers view human beings as creatures set down on earth intact with beliefs and desires or preferences that spring magically from our persons. But viewed objectively, it is clear that if we were to tag and track humans, we would be able to describe humans just as we could any other being. Like other animals, we must eat and drink, maintain body temperature, and protect ourselves from the elements. 
We have sense organs, including eyes and ears, and a nervous system, system that sends this information to the brain where it is processed to make decisions. We are mobile, we are social, we're curious, creative, and clever. We're technological problem solvers and builders. We share many of these characteristics with many other animals on earth, um, but we are just like very, very smart beavers, really. Um, our primary beliefs, desires, or preferences come from this nature. Thus, humans have many basic preferences in common. We enjoy eating, we want to stay warm, we prefer the company of other humans. And we also have some preferences that might be more specific to each of us as individuals. So one person might enjoy the flavor of mint while someone else might prefer the flavor of onions. But this all comes from our nature as human beings, aided by our nerves that send messages to our brain. But the preferences or natures of all entities on earth are not served by nerves and brains. A tree pulls up water and nutrients from the soil through its roots and it has leaves or needles to interact with the light from the sun in order to fuel its body. The tree doesn't have nerves that sense it senses its environment or brain to process input, but it somehow senses the light such that it grows in the direction of the light. Different plants have different preferences or natures or whatever you want to call that. Some grow best in direct light and others grow better in more shade. Some need more water and others store water and can exist in the desert. What about rocks? They seem to have no nature at all, except that we know that the planet is made of rocks, molten at the core, pushing up mountains over a period so long that the changes can barely be observed within a human lifetime, forming rock in such a predictable manner that humans can identify them, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic, and spinning on its axis and rotating around the sun in rhythmic cycles, and that is its nature. What is the nature of water and what is the nature of the air within the atmosphere of the planet? Water flows in a cycle, evaporating from the ocean and flowing towards land and meeting the mountains, coming down as rain or snow or golf ball sized hail, and then infiltrating into land aquifers or flowing into rivers to the ocean. The atmosphere contains a measured mix of gases such as oxygen, nitrogen, argon, argon carbon dioxide, and gases contained in the Earth's mantle escape to the surface through volcanic action. Also, we can't forget that there are entities outside our world that affect our world. The sun allows for the photosynthesis in plants and the production of vitamin D in animal skin, and the moon affects the tides of our oceans. So intrinsic value lies in the nature of each entity. Humans readily place value in our own nature, and because we are the creators of our ethical framework, why shouldn't we value our own nature? But we can't ignore that we also understand the nature of other entities and we know that they must act according to their nature but for some sort of interference human or otherwise that these entities do not desire to follow the natural laws that control them or feel when they are damaged in the same way that a creature with a nervous system and brain would doesn't mean that they are not damaged when they are damaged and humans can measure that damage uh, so if peter singer asked uh, quote, how do we know what it is like to be a tree dying because its roots have been flooded, unquote. We know that the tree pulls up water through its roots in order to live, but just enough and no more, which means that it can't remain oversaturated for long and still live. Clearly, for something that is alive, being dead is not good. A river that no longer runs is not good. An imbalance in the gases of the atmosphere is not good. Therefore, if our actions are causing the damage, then it is contradicting the nature of that entity and our action would be wrong unless it was necessary for our own survival. And we can return to this idea of necessity for human survival later. Some ecological philosophers argue in a way that would suggest a human-like quality to plants and, and non-living entities on Earth, but I think that this attempt to impart human characteristics to things in order to extend moral value to them is too much of a stretch, and I don't understand why entities must be human-like in order for humans to be concerned about how our actions affect them. So Peter Singer, in his book Practical Ethics, quotes this uh, fellow Holmes Rolston, Holmes Rolston, an American environment philosopher, <clears throat> and this is the quote from the, from the book, Natural selection picks out whatever traits an organism has that are valuable to it, relative to its survival. When natural selection has been at work gathering these traits into an organism, that organism is able to value on the basis of those traits. It is a valuing organism, even if the organism is not a sentient valuer, 
much less a conscious evaluator. And those traits, though picked out by natural selection, are innate in the organism that is stored in its genes. It is difficult to dissociate the idea of value from natural selection. <clears throat> So this is very much like what I've been saying when I talk about the value in the nature of an entity. But when he talks about being a valuing organism, this might be taking a unnecessary step too far. I understand what he's saying, that the organism contains genes that require that it develops in a certain way. And so it will respond to the environment accordingly. A plant will grow toward the light and its roots will grow into the richer soil. So it is not incorrect to say that it values the light and rich soil even if it doesn't have the consciousness of an animal. Now, Peter Singer says, um, quote, he must be aware that there is something odd about the idea of a valuer that is not sentient or conscious, unquote. And I would say um, that Peter Singer is stuck in a paradigm of consciousness. But Holmes or Rolston trying to demonstrate that being a valuing organism um, is unnecessary and also limiting to the argument. Um, so humans know that a plant requires light and grows better in rich soil. So if we cover the plant with a black tarp or propagate it in sand and it struggles or dies, we know that our actions contradict the nature of the plant. And so what we have done is wrong unless we are trying to kill a competing plant in order to grow a different plant that we want to eat. But more on that later. The argument for a valuing organism also is limiting in that it might be probable to say that a living plant values something, but more of a stretch to describe this manner, um, in this manner, the natural processes of non-living entities such as water, air, and minerals. This nature, which humans also know that we should not interrupt unless it is necessary. So in this section, Peter Singer kind of responds to this fellow by saying, um, you know, he compares a plant seeking light to that, like maybe like a guided missile or a solar powered machine. But this is not a solid comparison because natural objects in our environment can maintain themselves through natural processes, whereas a missile or a solar powered machine are directed and must be maintained by humans like any other tool that we create. Once humans have made the decision that a natural object is necessary um, to use as a tool for survival, whether it is the metal that makes up a missile or the piece of a tree that makes up a house, we have made a moral decision that the needs associated with our nature are greater than allowing for the nature of those natural objects in those instances. And um, rather than leaving them the metal intact in the ground or the tree intact. Um, at the point that we create artificial intelligence that can maintain itself separate from humans, then we might have to look at them more as beings rather than tools but that's not where we're at right now. So, so rather than um, so rather than trying to argue that plants and non-living entities have intrinsic value, wouldn't it be more plausible that these things have value because they are valuable to humans and other animals who themselves have moral value? If this were the case, um, you know, because that's what Peter Singer and Tom Reagan are saying. Well, I mean, it's just easier really to just say that plants and minerals and water have value because they're valuable to humans and animals, right? If this were the case, then we would have to conclude that there would be nothing wrong with human actions needlessly causing some plants and animals to become extinct as long as they were of no use to humans and other animals and their loss of little impact on the Earth's ecosystem. In that case, we would have to agree that it doesn't matter if we cause a particular species of grass or bird to become extinct, even if the destruction occurs for no good reason. I don't see how a person could argue that the needless destruction or extinction of entities on Earth could be considered morally acceptable by humans. But that is another implication of only extending moral value to plants, minerals, water, and air according to their usefulness to humans and other animals that Singer and Reagan have allowed into our moral sphere. Singer and Reagan both seem to have a discomfort with this implication, but conclude that the usefulness of these things to humans and other animals would normally be sufficient to protect them. And that's, that's probably true, but I think that there's problems when we view it that way. So let me bring a couple of paragraphs as quotes from their books, both Peter Singer and Tom Reagan, where they talk about um, an environmental ethic and possibilities. Peter Singer says, quote, this rejection of the ethical basis for a deep ecology ethic does not mean that the case for the preservation of wilderness is not strong. 
All it means is that one kind of argument, the argument for the intrinsic value of the plant, species, or ecosystem, is at best problematic. Unless it can be placed on some other firmer footing, we should confine ourselves to argu arguments based on the interests of sentient creatures, present and future, human and non-human. And unquote. Tom Reagan says, quote, as I have argued elsewhere, the very possibility of developing a genuine ethic of the environment as distinct from an ethic for its use turns on the possibility of making the case that natural objects, though they do not meet the subject of a life criterion, the subject of a life criterion, can nonetheless have inherent value. Attempts to show that this is conceptually absurd are inconclusive at best, while attempts to show that postulating inherent value in natural objects or collections of such objects, though intelligible, is unnecessary, suffer from the same fate. So he's saying that, you know, it's just, it's inclusive, inconclusive in both ways. Nevertheless, it is extraordinarily difficult to give an intelligible account of inherent value in this connection, unquote. That's his thinking on that. And then Tom Rankin goes on to say, assuming that we have found a way to confer intrinsic value on natural objects, quote, were we to show proper respect for the rights of the individuals who make up the biotic community, would not the community be preserved? And is not that what the more, more holistic systems-minded environmentalists want, unquote. So what he's saying here is that um, he says this because he has been arguing for individual rights, um, you know, that he's not arguing for like species or ecosystems, but he says, but if you were to give respect to individual rights, then you would automatically be, be giving it to the ecosystem. So let me repeat that again. Tom Reagan is saying that if we were in fact able to establish intrinsic value for natural objects, that respecting the rights of the individual would be sufficient to preserve the biotic community. And you know, this might be true, but in addition to intrinsic value, we can't ignore the interconnectedness of all beings if we are to give appropriate moral weight to different objects when making decisions that affect a community. I feel confident that natural entities do have intrinsic value as I've argued previously, but this doesn't create a sufficient ethical framework by itself. So I think that we need to um, not just look at intrinsic value, but also the interconnectedness of all of us on this earth. Traditionally, ethics helped us understand the balance between our individual human preferences and the preferences of other humans in society upon which we depend for survival. If humans were solitary like some other species of animal, then our interactions with other members of our species would not be such a concern, but we are social creatures and normally we live in groups and must modify our behavior within this group, even if sometimes it is incongruous to our individual interests. But what has been missing in this ethical framework is an understanding of how best to balance our individual human natures against the individual natures of other non-human entities on earth, and also how best to interact with all entities in this world community upon which we also depend for our survival. How do we determine if human actions are right or wrong in the context of our larger non-human world community? As with human communities where an action taken against one person may in turn affect a multitude of other people, we can't simply measure our own action, how our own action might affect a single tree or even all of the trees that make up the forest within a region. We would need to take into account how killing a single tree might affect a squirrel that might be living in it, but also how killing a forest will affect other plants and animals in the understory, how it might change the pattern of wind and water on the exposed soils after you've cut down all the trees, and we would also want to take into account how the action would affect humans. Perhaps the trees are being flooded because we are building a dam to generate energy for ourselves, and that would um, benefit us. So how do we determine if the need for a dam to us is more critical than the needs of the animals, plants, soil, and water in the forest? So in order to make decisions about what human actions are right or wrong, we have to take into consideration the impact of our actions um, on the complex interaction in the area of impact. And so in the United States, we have, um, you know, for ed federal agencies, they're required to prepare an environmental impact statement if a proposed major federal action is determined to significantly affect the quality of the human environment. And that includes, I um, took some little bits from this little um, web page. Um, this is what's included in environmental impact statement, impacts to threatened or endangered species, air and water quality impacts, 
impacts to historical and cultural sites, particularly sites of significant to indigenous peoples, social and economic impacts to local communities, including housing stock, businesses, property values, and consideration of aesthetics and noise, uh, cost and schedule analysis for all of the actions and alternatives presented. And so I take a direct quote from that uh, website, which I will link in the video description. Approximately 500 statements are prepared by federal agencies in the U.S. each year, and EIS allow outlines the status of the environment in the affected area, provides a baseline for understanding the potential consequences of the proposed project, identifies positive and negative effects for the environment, and offers alternative actions, including inaction, in relation to the proposed project, unquote. So there are some guardrails to complete destruction of the earth. We have some of these things. Um, these evaluations are only for large federal projects, though, not normally for private projects. And often these projects are working right up against the edge of extinction of plants and animal species and disasters for non-living entities. Uh, the reasoning for a project will err on the side of humans because the importance of a project will weigh more in favor of the one doing the assessment. Humans normally will naturally give more consideration to ourselves as individuals over other individuals, more importance to our family than to other humans, more importance to those in our community than other communities, more importance to existing beings compared to future beings, more importance to animals that are more like us than animals that have more differences, more importance to animals versus other living beings such as plants or inorganic objects and materials, except as they might be useful to ourselves like gold and diamonds. If I must decide between saving my mother and a world-renowned scientist who has the knowledge to save the earth from a terrible disease, I would save my mother. Getting back to a discussion about human survival, it is natural to prefer ourselves and to fight for our survival, just as any other animal on earth fights for its own survival and the survival of its offspring. The world community is not one big kumbaya. For example, should humans really be expected to love viruses? I think that Tom Reagan was trying to get at this question when he asked how a cancer cell or a murderer is good of its own kind, although that really isn't the right question. A cancer cell is just an apparent uh, change in the nature of a human, and a murderer is simply a human that has performed an immoral act. But what about a different question that might be more relevant, such as what is the good in a virus? We can look at this objectively and say that the good of the virus is in its nature, it is following its nature to find a home in beings that will transport it to other beings so that it can continue to replicate and survive. This is the nature of the virus. And we wouldn't want to thwart the nature of any entity unless it were necessary. So the virus has a right to try and replicate itself according to its nature, but humans will naturally place more importance on our own lives, as we should, right? And there would be nothing wrong with creating a vaccine that would cause our immune system to kill viruses. It would not be wrong to kill a bear if it is attacking us or to eat a plant to feed ourselves. Peter Singer made an argument that we could kill the members of another species of animal if we needed it to eat without being speciesist. And at first I accepted this idea, but I think now that indeed we are speciesist when we choose to kill one species of animal over another, for, even for food, we are speciesist and plantist and rockist. We will choose to kill or damage something for our own survival because we favor ourselves. And of course, we do favor ourselves and other entities, entities on earth will relentlessly follow their nature as well. But if we were to reason through this carefully, knowing that we value our ability to follow our own nature, we should also place value on the nature of other entities and not harm or damage or kill them, whether that be another animal or plant or rock, unless it is necessary for our survival. What I think that we are missing in our view of our relations with other entities on earth is the acknowledgement of our natural tendency to favor ourselves and to fear or disregard beings and entities that are different from ourselves or with whom we are unfamiliar, just as other entities will normally follow their own nature at the expense of others. However, if it is in our nature to be fearful, angry, jealous, and greedy, does this mean that we should just simply follow that nature? Um, that would hardly seem to make us good people. Yet we humans can be also be brave, calm, and charitable, and this is also in our nature. And historically, this has been a focus of human ethics, trying to control what can be some of our more destructive emotions, such as fear, anger, jealousy, greed, etc., so that we can make more measured decisions. If we are to be honest, people have a hard enough time really understanding the preferences of other humans, much less the preferences or natures of other animals and entities. 
If I am hungry and insist that I need to eat right now, another person might imagine that my hunger is not as intolerable as it actually is, especially if the other person is not hungry themselves. How capable are we really of making decisions that are both good for us and good for others as well? Tom Reagan talks about how humans have developed some heritable ethical intuitions, just as other animals. So I was just watching this video where um, there were penguins, penguins in this group, and it was, you know, really, really cold. And so they're moving the birds on the outside into the center so that, you know, none of them in the group freeze. They each get a chance to stay warm. Um, but maybe human ethical intuitions were developed for small human groups and not human groups the size of our modern nations and international organizations. Even if we have the intellectual ability to understand and measure the health of the world and the steps necessary to correct problems, do we have the social skills to decide upon and implement decisions that best affect the world in which we live rather than just thinking of ourselves? That is why, as I considered the population scenario in my last video, where I talked about determining some balanced population between humans and animals, setting aside a portion of the earth for humans and a great forest for other animals, and I came away from that thinking that it was not such a bad idea. I would add that there would need to be an allowance for an adequate population of not just humans and animals, but each type of plant and waterway and mountain too. And we might be able to assume that if we limited ourselves in this manner, that there would be no possibility of us making any meaningful negative impact on our atmosphere. Imagine our national forests and preserves, but on a much larger scale. Otherwise, I doubt that we would be able to make decisions except for those in favor of humans until we have encroached on every square inch of the habitable planet. The only difficulty with the existence of a great national forest would be trying to keep our sticky fingers out of it. Do I think that implementing this balanced population scenario is possible? No, probably not. And it's not the world that we are living in right now anyway. And we need to be able to make moral decisions within the reality in which we live now. So what is the goal? Within our ethical framework, what is it that humans would provide to other entities who have we have determined have moral value? So I want to just talk about what Peter, Peter Singer and Tom Reagan say we would give to um, the people and you know we're talking about they're talking about humans and animals that we say they have um, moral value so let's take a look at what Peter, Peter Singer says quote in the previous chapter I gave reason for believing that the fundamental principle of equality on which the idea that humans are equal rests is the principle of equal consideration of interests when we accept the principle of equality for humans we are also committed to accepting that it extends to some non-human animals, unquote. So Peter Singer is advocating for equal consideration of interests. Tom Reagan says, quote, the principle of basic moral possessed by all moral agents and patients is the right to be to respectful treatment. It was also argued that all moral agents and patients have a prima facie, don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, basic moral right not to be harmed. To say that this latter right is a prima facie right means that one, there are circumstances in which it is permissible to override it, but two, anyone who would override it must justify doing so by appeal to valid moral principles that can show be shown to override this right in any given case. So Tom Reagan is arguing that um, uh, for respectful treatment and um, and for animals and humans not to be harmed if we consider them, um, if we enclose them in our moral sphere, right? So I would just extend this ethic beyond humans and animals to all entities on earth and within our solar system. Although I don't know how much harm that we are capable of causing the sun or the other planets surrounding it, we should treat all the world's entities with respect and not harm them unless it is necessary for our survival to the extent that it is possible to control ourselves given our understandably self-centered natures. We should give equal consideration to their natures and that does not mean that we should treat everything the same. There are some entities who feel pain like humans and other animals. And so we would not normally want to chop off someone's arm or leg, but it would, wouldn't normally make a difference to chop off the limb of a tree. However, if we were to chop the tree off at its trunk, then it would die whereas taking an ax to water would make no difference at all. We should take into account how our actions today will affect all entities that we know will also exist in the future. What an ethical system must do is try and strike a balance between the needs of the individual and the needs of the community upon which we depend for survival, both human 
both the human and natural world community. We must begin to make decisions that respect the earth and its inhabitants and not simply view the earth as a resource for human use alone. And then we can teach our children the same respect and make this our moral norm. We should make individual decisions and support government decisions that make progress towards this ethic. But if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, it's nice to know that at least the rocks of the earth and the sun can't be permanently damaged by us, or not at this point, and that a whole new world of creatures will come along in a few million years to replace whatever we've goofed up. At the most basic level, all entities on earth are simply made up of atoms jostling around. These atoms have taken different forms, but each entity is subject to the nature of these individual forms. I am not discounting that humans are special because I think that we are really amazing creatures and I'm super happy to be alive, but really the world would be better off without us. So although humans can hardly help but be anthropocentric, anthropocentric, we really ought to be more objective when we are studying these problems of morality and we shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back too hard when we can finally recognize that other animals have a lot in common with humans while we still can't see that we are all subject to our natures and that includes plants, minerals, waters, and air too. So now um, I went on to write some more things, <laughs> you know, kind of talking about more of, um, you know, like how is my ethic, how, how does it work in practice in the world? You know, like there are actions can impact a lot of things like on what we buy, um, material goods and what we eat and things like that. And, um, you know, where do you draw the line in living your life and respecting and not harming other entities? So I thought I'd go here and talk about, you know, where, you know, Peter Singer and Tom Reagan had talked about when is it okay to kill and things like that. So both Peter Singer and Tom Reagan talk about the difficulty of drawing a line to decide, should I eat this or should I kill this? Or um, they both talked about decisions during extreme situations that might not be the same as under normal situations. For example, toss in a dog over the side when there is limited room on a life raft. But under normal circumstances, we all make decisions about where to draw the line or morality in the treatment of other entities on earth. So for example, I'm a vegan and the definition of veganism is, um, vegan, veganism is a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practical all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. And there's that line there as far as is possible and practicable. So it's not like we don't cause, I don't cause harm and death, right? But then there are others who have uh, philosophies that go further than this. For example, Jains who believe in nonviolence similarly to Hindus and Buddhists. Um, and so I took some little sections here from um, Wikipedia so food is restricted to that originating from plants since plants have only one sense as they, they see it and are the least developed form of life and dairy products. And some Jane scholars and activists support veganism as they believe that modern commercialized products, um, dairy products involve violence against farm animals. And that's true. They should not consume wine, flesh, butter, honey, and even fig, fig trees. Um, and so they, they go even further. So Janes go out of their way so as not to hurt even small insects and other tiny animals, um, make considerable efforts not to injure plants in everyday life as smart as far as possible. They don't eat root vegetables like potatoes, onions, roots, and tubers as they are considered to contain infant lives. Mushrooms, fungi, and yeast are forbidden. Um, uh, strict Janes do not consume food that has been stored overnight as it possesses a higher uh, concentration of microorganisms. Uh, they're not, they don't consume yogurt, for example, unless it's been made freshly the same day. Janes do not consume fermented foods, beer, wine, and alcohols to avoid killing a large number of microorganisms organism, associated with the fermenting process. So I'm not willing to draw the line that far when it comes to nonviolence. I'm sure that I kill some bugs when I'm driving or from inattention when I'm walking. I eat fermented foods that contain living bacteria and I cook or yeasts and I cook them to death when I bake sourdough bread. It's enough to me that they aren't sentient. I've killed trees to make room for my house and garden and probably killed toads and other critters in the process of clearing land. I eat root vegetables. I don't think that the Janes are silly for going too far though. 
I have that same sense when I pull up a plant knowing that I've killed it. And even when I cook the sourdough bread, I do feel sad for all the little buddies who've been eating and farting and burping away to make the bread so obviously rise. So I don't think that, that they're being silly and I wouldn't, it wouldn't actually be that hard for me probably to, to follow a Jane philosophy, but I've decided not to draw the line there. And everyone needs to draw their line where it best fits consistently with their values. And so um, there are actions that we can take today. I do think that in this day and age, when most of us have other options, that the suffering of sentient creatures in factory farming is something that is not consistent with most people's values and that it only occurs because it is hidden and it's a habit. Um, and by saying that, I don't think that people who operate factory farms are all bad. This is a transaction between the farmer and the people who eat those animals and want an inexpensive product. And most of my friends and family eat those animals and they're good people. I used to eat those animals and I consider myself a good person. So this is not about separating the good guys from the bad guys. This requires changing uh, changes and that requires looking at the lives of these animals not just imagining their lives, but actually looking at it with our own eyes and also asking ourselves if the suffering is worth it. And, you know, so that's kind of going back to the very beginning of where Peter Singer talked about in his book, um, Animal Liberation. And he really focused on, um, you know, animals in factory farms and animals that are experimented upon. And because that affects most of these animals. And so I think that, you know, there are things that we can do in our everyday lives, even though we are self-centered and, and we should be self-centered. Um, that's part of our nature that, that we are capable of looking at other entities on earth and um, making changes so that we do less harm. And I would say that doesn't mean just animal. It also other means other humans and um, all of our other, you know, entities on earth, including like mountains and rocks, minerals and air and water and things like that. So that is my ethical framework. Um, don't harm or damage, you know, unless it's necessary. That's it folks. And I'm moving on with my life now. Let me know in the comments below what you think.